in Sunday school, so I know there's a couple, right? If you haven't seen it, it's full of action and humor, and all of our favorite Muppets show up. You have Kermit and Fozzie, Miss Piggy, Pepe, Gonzo, and his chickens, and, and everybody, right? They're all there. And there's also plenty of what the kids call bling. Do you know what bling is? I'm kidding. It's not just kids. We all call it bling, right? All the flashy, flashy jewelry. CeeLo and the crew sing about all the Christmas presents they could get, all the fancy toys, all the latest technology. Uh, the, I think he pulls up in a Bentley convertible, right? In a snowstorm? With the top down. Yes. He sings about having a 60-inch TV in every room, right? But at its core, the song captures the essence of Christmas. See, the Muppets and CeeLo, though they have all that stuff, what they're saying is they really don't need all of that stuff. All they really want or need for Christmas is love. I'm not really sure that the Muppets ever set out to make any kind of grand theological statement with their Christmas song. I really doubt they had that kind of conversation. But the song does tap into the truth, as many songs do, that all we need is love. And today, as we celebrate our second Sunday in Advent, in our journey of God with us, we are celebrating love. When Jesus came into our world as a baby, he was the human embodiment of the gift of God's love. When he came as Emmanuel, God with us, he came as love. How many people here have ever held an infant, a newborn infant? Then you understand that he came as love. But love is a word that we have difficulty with. We struggle with it not because we don't understand, but because we've watered it down. As Rob Bell puts it, We'll tell somebody that we love them, and in the same breath, we'll talk about how much we love a new car or a certain pair of pants. I mean, I love my wife, and I also love tacos. These can't be equal, can they? I mean, I love my wife, and I do love tacos. They're not. We have a flimsy love that is aimed at the material, and we allow that flimsy love to consume our lives. Even in that Muppet song, they talk about all the flimsy material temporary things in the midst of saying all they need is love. See, we have the love of money, the love of new gadgets, new cars, new clothes, the love of drugs and alcohol, adrenaline rushes, the love of food. But none of these are lasting. They'll all rot on this earth, but there's a different love that we are shown, a love demonstrated, a love lived, a love meant to inspire. And this love incorporates grace and commitment unlike that love for the flashy material. So let's talk about a love story. You know, I saw recently an ad, um, I think it was on the side of a Facebook feed. It was an ad where you can sign up for letters to be mailed to you, like the old-fashioned way, you know what I mean? So that you can feel attachment to somebody who's not even there. And you can select what kind of letters you want, whether you want them to be like a serialized story, or if you want them to be more romantic, or like love letters. So you can sign up for a service that can give you a love story. I didn't sign up, by the way, if you're wondering. But I want to talk about a grander love story. God's love is woven through our very creation and existence and being. God is committed to us. God loves us. And we see this when we look at that story in Scripture. When we look from, from Genesis through Revelation and we see this overall story, we see that God is committed to us and that God loves us. When God's beautiful creation defied the divine, God came back. 
From Eden to Babel, from Noah through Abraham, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, and more, we, the people of God, turn our backs, denounce our blessings, move away from the source of love, and fill our lives with temporary pleasures. But God is committed and continues to send messengers and signs so that we know we are loved. And then this story takes a turn. We see God's promise of commitment and love come to fulfillment with the birth of a child that is meant to demonstrate in our world, in our time, in our ways, how we too can love, how we can be forgiven, how we can experience grace, though we are not worthy, though we continue to sin and move away, God loves us and comes after us. If this was an 80s movie, this would be, you know, the boy outside in the rain with a boombox. Commitment. Jesus' entry into the world is an interesting story. And we celebrate it every year as a reminder that we need to come back to God and the love the divine shares. But also as a reminder that we need to be making the way for this love to re-enter the world. If we were watching a movie of God's love being made manifest in this Christ child, and there are plenty of Christmas movies you could watch about this, right? This would be like one of those moments where we could just pan back. And as we pan back, we drift out to that drab and dusty Galilean village, and we see a wider and wider vision above the ancient landscape and geographic forms we recognize as continents and oceans, and farther above the great blue ball of Earth, and still farther back we could see the solar system and the Milky Way galaxy, and somehow wider still through the limits of the universe and space and light and time themselves, until finally somewhere beyond the limits of physics that bind our creation, there is only a presence, a supernatural, infinite presence, that is love. There is only God, yet somehow over and within all things and present and moving within all time, including the entire history of humanity, there is love. The Apostle John said it most simply and possibly the best way, God is love. He wrote in 1 John 4, 16, So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. That is the nature of our God. Love in its purest form. Love was there at the center of God's creative forces that made the universe and formed people in God's image to be in relationship with God the divine. Love was there when the world fell into sin and rebellion, and despite the catastrophic consequences of our fall, love was there in shepherding us into an altered world. Even then, love was making a way to restore all that is lost. This is our love story. Love forged that covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Love continually led the Israelites through relocation and resettlement, through triumph and imprisonment and exile. As we trace throughout the Hebrew scriptures, love guided and corrected and exhorted and showed mercy to us, the ever disobedient and the easily distracted. In our Advent story, love was taken the form of humanity in the Messiah, Jesus. Love is God with us. And love would be with Jesus' parents, with Mary and Joseph to care for and provide everything that they would need in attending to this child. But the test of any good love story is, is love enough? Is this love strong enough or deep enough or true enough to handle what life throws at it. From the trivial and annoying to the catastrophic and potentially crushing, can this love handle it? Can this love handle 
our debt? Can this love handle this argument? Can this love handle the struggles with infertility or with the loss of a child? Can this love handle it? Love is enough. God is enough and God's love is committed and faithful. In Malachi, we are given this somewhat terrifying scripture about a refiner's fire, right? But yet in this scripture, we are shown a promise that shows God's commitment to love. That we all go through this refiner's fire. There is equality in us being refined. And and the promise is that there will be one who comes to prepare the way for us to go through this. And then in Luke, we see God's faithfulness and love as John has come to prepare the way to bring all of us into equality with God's love. I was listening to this podcast um, by comedian Pete Holmes. And what's weird is that he has this relationship with theologian Rob Bell that I never knew about. And he's talking about how he, how he was at Rob Bell's house once and Rob Bell started to explain to him this parable. Are we familiar with the parable of a day's wages where there are three people that come to work um, and the first one works all day and the second one works half a day and the last one works just a couple of hours. And at the end, the person who hired him pays them all the same, right? Do we know that parable? And it makes a lot of us kind of unnerved and a little bit upset to hear this parable because we always picture ourselves as the ones who work all day, right? We might be those ones coming in in the last couple hours, but we like to think of ourselves as the ones who work all day. And we think, we deserved it. How do these other people not have it? And the way Pete Holmes tells about Rob Bell explaining is that it's not about the material. They all get paid the same because you can't divide infinity, And it is about God's love. It doesn't matter when you recognize the relationship or when you come into relationship with God. God is so committed to you that you get all of the love. You cannot divide something that is infinite. That is a commitment that we might not understand in our world. And yet God demonstrates it for us. It doesn't matter when we come into this relationship, God is committed to us. And we too are called to be committed to this love. We are called to prepare the way. From reading scripture and praying with our families to service and the Christmas celebration to our community and through church world service and Haiti missions to missions and other communities as well. This love is greater than any of us and calls to be shared. The love of God is with us. The love of God with us is God's perfect love in human form that we celebrate. And this is the love that knows exactly what we need no matter what we are facing this season. Whether it's support from or restoration to another person or whether it's an encounter with God of the miraculous that you need, God's love is with us. It is here for you. And it is making a way to accomplish God's work in your life. And as mind-blowing as it is, God's love is eternal. It is infinite. It was, it is now, and it will be. And God will never stop demonstrating love in tangible ways that are both daily occurrences in our lives and history-changing events like Christ's birth. Eventually, all those temporal things that we love, all those things we know will come to an end at some point, the good, the bad, and life itself. But this love that God with us lived out before us and will hold us forever and ever. Paul writes in Romans 8, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor heights, nor depths, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. In this Advent season, we have this opportunity to reflect on how we can share the hope and love of Christ, how we can forgive and accept, how we can extend grace. Jesus taught us a new command, I give you love 
one another. As I have loved you, you must love one another. It is by this that everyone will know that you are my disciple if you love one another. There is no other sign. There is no other measure. It is by this that people will know that we are Christ's disciples if we love one another. And the ability to do this begins by us opening ourselves to God's love. And then it grows and overflows as we extend kindness and care and support to others around us. And sometimes it takes a small step and sometimes it requires a bigger leap. But through it all, we can trust and know that it is love that holds us. Because God is with us. Love is with us. It is an eternal, vast, and powerful love. And yet at the same time, gentle and tender and personal love. And it is this love that will make a way. No matter what we are facing today or in the season ahead or in the days in our future, it is God's love that stands with us, for us, and it's by this love that we can share with one another the joys of Christmas. Amen.